This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Greetings one and all, and thank you for joining me for this chat featuring Tom England from the Swedish heavy metal powerhouse, Evergrey. The catalyst for the conversation is due to the launch of another new album from the group. This one is titled A Heartless Portrait, The Orphean Testament, and it barely comes six months later than the launch of their previous album. So these guys have really got it going on on the creativity front at the moment. If you're listening via the podcast, I have selected a tune to share with you. This one is titled Save Us. Of course, it comes from the new album. If you've tuned in via YouTube, we're going to cut to the conversation right now. So let's go. Tom, how are you going? I'm all good, man. How are you? Good, mate. Good. How's the uh, how's the old Zuma grind been treating you? <laughs> the old what? <laughs> Zuma grind. You can't call them phone grinds anymore. They're all on Zoom or Teams <laughs> these days. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's long days, but it's dude. It's because people seem to appreciate what we do. So it's like I'm happy to be able to do to do this. Absolutely. I love the fact you've got your guitar with you. I've got to say, I had a conversation with Wes Hauk from Alluvial and a few other bands, but, you know, Wes Hauk, and uh, he had the same thing. So, mate, whenever you want to let rip, I'm a guitarist and bassist myself, just go ahead. Yeah, I have this uh, arthritis problem in my fingers. I'm uh, having to use... I have, I'm having to use them at all times to, in order to get the motion back in my fingers, so it's a big problem for me right now. So... Every every second that I'm not doing interviews, I'm moving them up and down the fretboard. So that's not good, mate. Is that is that just from overuse, so to speak, or is it the you know the temperature changes and the like that no doubt experience when you go from inside to outside and back again? I think it's. I mean, of course, it's because of overuse from 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 the start, but it's also the it appeared when I didn't use it. It appeared when I was on vacation. Mm. So that's when it sort of stiffened up and became. So now it's way better, but I still can't play solos and stuff like that. So, oh, Jesus, that sucks. That's no good, mate. Yeah, what's what's the long term prognosis, or do you, do you have one? <laughs> I was at the physiotherapist the other day, and she said, "Well, that's all I can do for you." I was like, "What?" No, so, what about surgery or whatever? It's like, no, you have to. I do do these stretching exercises four thousand times a day, and hopefully that wears off or you know gets milder or something what about in the day-to-day pain in the day-to-day just going shopping or walking the dog that sort of thing is it painful no it's not, it's not that pain. it's just this bend you know this last bit you know where i can bend this finger like this right yeah see all the way mm. i can only bend this like that so which makes it very hard when you're doing you know trying to bend shit have, have you had to think about the unthinkable from the perspective that you might have to put down the guitar just to prolong your music career? I mean, I just cancelled the show for the first time in my life because of uh, reasons, so... Oh, uh, shit, mate. That's terrible. I'm hoping, yeah. I'm hoping it will be okay in a month. Uh, I'm hoping. Let's say that. I, and if anything, uh, at least I will hopefully be able to play rhythms, you know? And, uh, let's see. Yeah, but it's not your style, mate. You're a bit of a shredder. You know how to do that stuff. Um, you know, I, I you know the, the music that's within you might just take a bit of a different way to come out. You know, I'm not I'm not comparing you to Jason Becker, but you know what Jason Becker had to do, of course. Sure. You know? And compared yeah. to that, you know, you do what you got to do, right? Well, well, and it's also yeah. a sucky timing. I'm I'm also right now producing a signature model for me with comparison, and you know, okay. so it's w- would have been lovely to promote that in the best best way possible so that's my aim at least let's see where let's see where we end up well godspeed and good luck on that front because the quality on your your new album um it's all there mate you know it's it's look it's lucky number 13 for you guys Um, (laughs) yeah i I never thought of that (laughs) (laughs) well you know a heartless portrait the orphean testament love the name um, I've got a copy, of course. I think I've got a stream copy, but I've been listening to it. And uh, look, one of the things I say about everything you've done, mate, is that it's imbued with uh, it's imbued with quality. You don't let your fans down, and there's a lot of them. Um, and I, I got to and please take this as a compliment. It's more of the same, in much the same of much the way that what fans expect from you guys. Would you agree? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I, we, I write and we write music in the only way we know how to, you know, and mm. uh, that's uh, and and the only we know way we know how to is to please ourselves first, you know, and uh, the day. Every every time I start writing a song, it needs to be better than the last, and that's the only recipe we have for writing. And it, we need to be fired up and engaged and 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 excited to write music. Uh, it sounds simple, and it's uh, and it is because that's the only that's the only thing we need in order to sort of keep this apparatus going, right? And mm. uh, we're on our thirteenth <laughs> album and. And our twelfth album was our biggest commercial success. So it's like, it's weird to have that coming in the like you know the the last five years or five albums or whatever it is that the, all of a sudden people seem to catch up. <laughs> so either, well, we, either we done something right or you done something right, you know. So it's like <laughs> I was going to say, mate, you're like a twenty five year overnight sensation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the 200 hit wonder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it takes that long, doesn't it? Especially, well, metal, as you know, I mean, God, you, you're in it, you're smack bang in the middle of it, but it's so weird, isn't it? You can be doing what you do, plugging away, and then all of a sudden things just sort of happen. You're like, what did we do differently? <laughs> That's just it. I think, yeah. uh, and if, if I'm over analyzing it, I think it's also, it's, Partially production, it's it's a big part that there is nowadays a sense of, you know, writing um, music that is in a minor key, but but with a but with a string of hope in it. I think that's what people are clinging on to, you know. So yeah, a string of yeah. hope. Was this album in the can around the same time as Escape of the Phoenix? Because they're about five five or six months apart from the release dates, aren't they? It's like I think it's a year in between, but a we year, started. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we started. Uh, we started composing for, for uh, Heartless Portrait after the day after Escape of the Phoenix came out. We made a decision, as we realized that we would, wouldn't be able to play live for a mm. decent amount of time. We said that we might as well just keep on going and and do do, do this. We were also switching labels, so it made perfect sense in a in a in a more business strategic way too, you know, to have something come out as fast as possible. What what did Napalm do for you that the previous label didn't or don't weren't able to do? I don't know yet. <laughs> <That's true. Let's> <laughs> they paid more money to start with. That's a good start. That's a very uh, good start. <laughs> other than that, uh, no, but I mean, I think it feels great. And with that said, I would also say that AFM up until that day was the best label we have had. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, after four albums, I think also things stagnate. It gets too comfortable. And uh, when things get too comfortable, that's when when things are slowing down and people are sort of taking things for granted and whatnot, you know. So, Napalm now have, it feels like they have a younger crew on board. They have a mm. more contemporary in the now, you know, take on social media and whatever. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, it feels great so far. Great, it feels great. Yeah, you got to hand it to the young ones, mate. They do know what they're doing with the bloody social media thing. It's not native to me, and I find it incredibly difficult to get my head around it. My worst subject at uni by far, I've got to say. It's uh, but if you've got people who know and they're they're switched on with social media, it can change the game completely. Then that's what you need to do. You got to roll with the times, and if you don't, you're mm. out. You know, you're going to be in irrelevance for for the rest of your life. So that's yeah, it's it's a steep learning curve for me too. Uh, I'm not interested in spending time on that either. I need to be creative. Mm. That's that's my end game in a sense. So for mm. for me to sort of step into all these filming YouTube videos and setting up lights and learning yeah, computer yeah. programs and shit, it's like. Yeah, I would like to have somebody come here and set it up, and then I could just uh, press record. That's what I want to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Now focus on your strengths. I get that, you know? And uh, yeah. um, look, with this this uh, new album to A Heartless Portrait, um, did you try anything different on this album that you hadn't done before? I know I've given you a lot of praise in so far as, you know, it's very cons consistent and based on the career trajectory you've had to date. But what what new things, if any, did you try on this album that weren't, on previous albums 
The, I mean, the thing that comes to mind is that I've, I mean, I've done so much music the last two years. I've done two albums with Silent Skies. I've done one with Redemption and one, mm. two with, with Evergrey now and a bunch of other stuff, computer game music, all, all kinds of stuff. So, of course, that sort of influences my creative path in a sense, how mm. I take on a project. Uh, but for me, with Evergrey, I'm invested 100% with my heart as well. While as when I'm doing computer game music, I can just do it mechanically in a sense. I get a order for a certain type of music and then I start composing together with my, my friend Vikram. Uh, and with Silent mm. Skies, I'm also invested with my heart. So for, for me, it's the thing, I went from recording to recording to recording here. So I went from Silent Skies to Evergrey to Silent Skies to Evergrey. And in Silent Skies, I sing differently. You know, I sing with a more low key, mellow, mm. falsetto voice in some aspects. And so that's what's come to mind that okay, I used the falsetto in, in, in Evergrey. And that's something that I had never done. Uh, at least not to the extent that I do on this album. Mm. And that seems to catch on really well, too, because given the two first songs, they are both using that. So, And they're great successes so far. Yeah, great. Look, I mean, that, well, that's the thing. You know, you got this penchant for crafting moody, memorable, heavy heavy metal, and uh, that vocal style will lend itself very handily to what you're doing here. So, mm. so another question for you just around, uh, you know, you've been recording long enough. You've been recording for years now. You've, you've actually seen the technological changes happen. I'm talking about the at the interface in the studio. So, so in your opinion, do you think your choice of guitars, amps is as important as maybe the emphasis you've placed on it in the past as, say, it is now compared to with a, what effects you use, the plugins, all of the applications, all of the technological bullshit that's at your fingertips. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you mean, I mean, you could almost virtually pick up any guitar and it'll sound like you if you've got the right applications and plugins, or do you disagree? Uh, I disagree. <laughs> but I disagree to the extent that I've been playing comparison guitars for 20 years. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it's my brand. And I don't care what brand you play. The brand that you play that you're comfortable with is the one that you should be playing. You know, yeah. uh, it doesn't matter if it costs uh, five thousand euros or or two hundred bucks. It doesn't matter. You know, it's whatever you. And I think that the that instrument is what's gonna make you sound the best. Then you can put it through whatever you see in your computer. Or uh, I use a lot of on this album. I play only through the computer in terms of uh, soloing. Mm. I use Neural DSP and it sounds fantastic. And for me, it's, for me, songwriting is about convenience. I don't want it to be comfortable, but I want it to be easy. I want it to sound as exactly as I want it to sound immediately. I don't have time to fuck around with, you know, mm. <laughs> tuning shit for two hours because then my okay. vibe is gone, right? But then I also have the best stamp in the world built to me by uh, uh, Reinhold Bogner at Bogner Amplification. Yeah. Nice. And he built for me and me, me and me and Henrik signature amps that he only built for us. And Ed Van Halen too, I think. <laughs> Which is <laughs> slightly Good sick. Company to but be. you know <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but uh, so that I use for all of my rhythm inspiration and then i have two lines going into the computer one for just that i so that i just hear i'm pointing that way because it's standing there mm. uh and one so that i hear the amp in the room and one that is going lined into the computer so so to get it's also getting recorded at, at the same time so that part of technology i love the instant uh sort of gratification mm. and that's mm. also brutally honest sometimes that it sounds like fuck i need to spend some time on playing this because it sounds <laughs> useless you know and that's also one of the things actually now that i come to think of it that that i changed for this album very much is that i really put emphasis on on uh, my solo writing because i write my solos i don't play them um, in inspiration only, I write mm. them piece by piece, like Adrian Smith, pre pretty much. You know, it's well, a, a, I like them yeah. too. well well composed in a sense, if I can say so myself. But uh, yeah, so yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. I was rambling on for a good while there. <laughs> no, you answered it very eloquently, and I'm so glad you brought up Adrian Smith here because I can't. God bless the man, but I can't stand Yannick. 
Um, I wish he wasn't in the band, to be honest with you. Um, I know he's written some of their decent songs over the last 30-odd years or so, but you compare his solos, it just sounds like someone's picked up a guitar and thrown it off a building and recorded it. <laughs> Compared to the, the the beautiful melodies, the craftsmanship, someone like Adrian Smith and, and you, mate, you get that too in your playing. I can definitely hear that, by Thank the you. way, so it is noticed. Yeah, I mean, Adrian is one of my, I think is highly underappreciated, if you can say that, by a person who sold like 100 million albums. But uh, no, you great. know what I mean? It's like as a, as a guitar player, it's all about, I mean, as a musician for me, it's all about the songs for me. Uh, and um, I think... Adrian Smith's soloing is like conversations for me, you know, and in that aspect, it also resembles vocals. In, in, it's not that much of the technical aspect. Even if he knows how to do it, he, he doesn't mm. emphasize on that. It, it's not that important. So, yeah, uh, fantastic guitar player. It's not it's not every guitar player that you can sing every single note to, right? Oh, it's amazing. They, they are. They, they, the voicing and the phrasing is is so melodic. It, it could be, it could be sung. I mean, my favourite solo from him, not by far, but it just edges a few of the other really good ones that he's done. But is the one on "Stranger in a Strange Land." Yeah, just, I, was just to, I was about to say the same. <laughs> yeah, how good is it? Yeah. I mean, it's I mean perfect. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's almost perfect. It's one of the few solos I would say uh, of a popular band, of course that you wouldn't remove a note or change a note or the cadence or the placement or the tempo or anything. It's just all there. It's right there. It's just masterful, you know. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, what what it's about amazing. lyrics? What about lyrics for you this time around? Were you, were you tempted to dip your toe into all this COVID bullshit or potentially? No, I mean, the, I think, uh, <laughs> I think yeah. Evergreen has always been about writing what's, uh, I mean, that's also partially why the title is A Heartless Portrait. It's about me writing about me in the most honest, sincere way I possibly mm. can present it. And sometimes it's been too careless. You know, I've been too careless towards myself. And that's why it's heartless. It's a blunt, honest, not always flattering uh, view of myself and what I've gone through 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 my life. and how I see myself not fitting into a world that mostly is getting more vile and evil and, and hostile all the time and how I really don't want to fit in either, you know, it's like... Mm. Uh, that said, it's also about reawakening the things that is important in life. It's about, you know, it's about uh, what are your true morals and values when, you know, Shit hits the fan. Ask the people in Ukraine today, and I will guarantee you that they won't mention a word about fucking TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, right? Uh, it's about. It's just crazy. Yeah, it's just crazy. I mean, I, I know there are wars and that have gone on for for ages, and and you know the US only invaded Iraq in two thousand and three, but we're talking about Europe specifically. The last time Europe had a war was seventy or eighty odd years ago. Something that my, yeah, my grandfather no, participated fucking, in. Here we are. It's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and, and this is 500 kilometers away. <laughs> it's so strange, to your point. We live in a world with TikTok, yet there are people whose apartment buildings are being blown to smithereens by fucking inter -ballistic, uh, ballistic missiles. And we're sitting here. Missiles. The world is sitting here watching a bully hit somebody in the face repeatedly. And we're mm. not doing anything. Because it's too late. It will escalate anyway. Hmm. Fucking go in and kill him. That's the only thing that will solve this. That aside, if I can ask your opinion on what you think the end game is going to be, what do you think the next six months will look like over there? He will never admit a defeat. He would never admit that doing something wrong. Uh, it's going to end with Ukraine accepting the Russian terms uh, in one way or another. Mm. Or it will go on for 20 years. Yeah. I tend to think it's going to be the latter. I just think I've, I've known a few Ukrainians throughout my time and uh, they're a bit like the Poles, fiercely independent, very nationalistic, and they could not give a fucking fuck. And if anybody comes under their turf, a bit like what the Americans found in Afghanistan, they'll just wait until they've sure. got a time to, to, to retaliate. I think that's what's going to happen. And unfortunately, in that process, it's the, the mum and dads and the, the kids and the regular people that are going to suffer in that process. But at least, what I think I'll say, at least with Ukraine, you know, they've got 
Poland and a few other countries that are willing to sort of, well, so far are willing to sort of step up and help out because what other choice have they got? Yeah, I mean, we're all, I think Sweden will have two to 300,000 refugees in Sweden mm. alone. So it's like, but I mean, at the same time, I would say that how long do you watch somebody get uh, killed before it's morally impossible to do something? I mean, people say, yeah, if we interfere now, it will, it will, it will uh, affect us all. It's already affecting us all. And if we let him get away with this, then he's just going to regroup and uh, then he's going to go further into Finland and into mm. Li uh, Lithuania and to Estonia. And, you know, it's, uh, it won't end with him. It doesn't look like it, not, not with the way the Soviet Union carried on. And that's certainly what he's trying to do is reestablish the boundaries of the, of the Soviet Union. Yeah, which he's a, he's a yeah. madman, dude. He's a... A fucking psychopath, mate. I know. As I said, it's the oh, regular Russians too. You know, regular Russians are doing their own thing. This has got nothing to do with the Russian people. Like the, the psycho the psychopath Xi Jinping that runs China, the Chinese people have got nothing to do with the regime. They're just beheld, they're beholden yeah. to it. You know, it's it doesn't history just keep on repeating itself. The average person, you know, these lunatics that are up the top, one man, you know, in both cases, Xi Jinping and, and Vladimir Putin, one man in both countries, wielding so much power, yet does so with complete impunity. Yeah. And for what? I don't know. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't, I don't know. It's, I'm in my mid-40s and I, and I look at it and think, I thought we would have learnt by now. I was hoping we would have learnt by now, but we haven't. No. No, we yeah, haven't. It's sick. Yeah. It's sick. Hey, change, change topics to another one of my favourite guitarists who I've had a number of conversations with, your fellow Swede, Marcus, Marcus Jadel. Hmm? Um, what was it like working with Marcus? It was uh, short, intense, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think we did a great album. Uh, he is a great guitar player, and uh, and uh, I, it's such a long time ago now. So much water has passed <laughs> under this bridge that it's like it. And it was also in a time of my life where I didn't feel the best, you know. Yeah. Uh, so so it was. Uh, I think that whole experience of that album has a sort of dark undertone you know yeah. uh, for me personally but music wise i think it turned out great great partnership you both you both sounded great yeah yeah and different also right very different players but i love that i love that juxtaposition of yeah. opposites in so many yeah. ways you know absolutely yeah, he, yeah. he was never an obvious pick for you guys but i think it worked out really well for for the album that he was there and the live shows that were Absolutely, performed, yeah. you know. So, um, I've asked. Oh, I've, have I got time for another a few more questions, or have you got another one coming through? Uh, let's see when I'm due for the next. time. What time is it? Eleven. Oh, uh, it's uh, eight past uh, the hour. So, now. Yeah. Uh, six more minutes. Okay. Did you need to get a coffee or tea or anything like that, or are you cool if I ask one or two more questions? Uh, it's, it's fine. I've asked this question of quite a few of, of uh, the Scandinavian musicians over the years. So, of course, I'm always curious when I talk to somebody like you who's been doing it for as long as what you have been. Mm. But look, the reality is, and it's probably just my Australian-centric perspective looking at things, but look, you started Evergrey at a band, at the band at a time when commercial success for metal in the big Western markets, Britain, the United States, certainly Australia, if we consider the relative size market, but... It wasn't going to happen, okay? Remember, Metallica had gone butt rock or whatever they did on load. Judas Priest had, had gone. They, they were still pretty good, you know, with Ripper there. Iron Maiden had totally failed, in my opinion, with what they were doing there with Blaze, not Blaze's fault. But really, metal was on its on its way out, and it's the big leading lights were started to become the Scandinavian bands. Mm. But, um, look, did you... When you started a metal band, did it even cross your mind that it could even become a career or was it not even thought of that or did you not even think of it and just thought, oh, we're just going to do what we do and if it becomes a career, it's going to become a career? Because I know for a lot of Australian artists and acts, mate, even thinking about picking up a guitar and playing metal in 1995 and 1996, you just, you, you just didn't. No, but I mean, for me, it was, uh, we had Europe, you know. We had Europe, the band that uh, showed us that world success was possible. I would say, and then we had Yngwie Malmsteen, and then we had uh, all these bands that made it possible 
to reach outside of Sweden. And that's all we needed. That's all we needed to get influenced and inspired. And at the time when I started in the 90s with death metal era, that yeah. also started, started to bubble in Gothenburg and in Stockholm and, and started to make ways through the world as well, you know. Uh, and uh, so it was a great environment to be sort of brought up in, and 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 uh, because you saw your friends succeed, you know, you saw everyone. Ah, yeah. oh, they're going on a, you know, van tour in Poland for four days, which was amazing when you were like seventeen, mm -hmm. you know. So no, I always had that uh, idea of making it. I always thought I would be very much bigger than we are but at least i'm still doing <laughs> something that is contemporary then that people seem to like you know it's uh, and of course your values and your expectations of life and music in general it changes when you when you grow older and you've been around the world a couple of times you know it's uh, mm. back to is that what is important it's important for me to be able to keep on producing music that's it Scandinavian artists are responsible, in my opinion, for keeping rock and metal going through the 90s from the perspective of new bands and new blood, but not just that reigniting the flame when the internet took the power away from the fucking bullshit media, mainstream media, magazines or whatever, and gave... I remember myself, I remember being a kid in 1997 looking at band websites, In Flames website, Megadeth website, this sort of stuff, and it was so yeah. liberating. But I, I don't think if it was for, for the Gothenburg scene specifically... And also the Norwegian black metal scene, metal wouldn't have come back the way it did. It might have come back, but it certainly would never have come back the way it did. Is that? Do you, do you share my opinion on that? Yeah, and I would say that absolutely with the death metal and the black metal, and uh, but also Hammerfall bringing back yeah. you know melodic metal and ordinary vocals into uh, into in, in, into metal again made a huge change and made the world react and appreciate mm. that sort of music again. Even if it wasn't my cup of tea, uh, I at least appreciated everything that they did for for the genre as a, you know, a soul. So it's, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I was worried when, uh, I was I was worried when everything sounded like uh, you know Alice in Chains and and, uh, mm -hmm. and Nirvana and stuff like that. Even though I enjoyed a lot of it, I also saw. No, I wasn't. I I never was worried that metal would go away. I, I actually wasn't. Mm. It felt like I had too much around yeah, yeah. me. Mm. I had too much of it around me that would that said different and that spoke and you know that showed me different. So. Mm. All right, last question for you then. Mate, when's the book coming out? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> <laughs> your memoir, your autobiography. I actually started writing a book a couple of years ago and I actually got a book contract in the US as well, but that sort of is put on, a, what do you call it, hiatus in a, in a pause in a sense. So yeah. let's see. Let's see, I want to do a real, a real, uh, you know, real book. I don't want to. I want it to be about me. I'm sick about me. <laughs> I'm I want to make it me. about you. The fans want to read about you. I mean, you've been doing it as I say as long as anybody, and you've got, you've got the stories, mate. So I hope. Look, either way, write your novel if that's what you want to do, but make sure you get your biography <laughs> out there too, because I'm sure it'll be killer read. Yeah. Let's see where we're at with next time we speak. Okay. All right, mate. Good luck with it. All Congratulations right. on a stellar career. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Thank you for having me, man. Pleasure. Bye, mate. bye. Catch ya. Bye. Tom England from Evergrey there, ladies and gents. I was very curious to hear his response there about why he thinks heavy metal in Sweden never really went away. It's enduring popularity in the great nation of Sweden, a country that has given us so many killer heavy metal acts over the years. Radio, I have written a book, you can buy it through some links at scarsandguitars.com. I've only got the e-version available. I might print up some physical copies if demand is there, but wrap your reading eyes around an e-copy. Go across to scarsandguitars.com. Amongst the pages, you'll find out all about, straight from, you'll find out, you'll find out interesting stuff, straight from the mouths of the members of groups such as Morbid Angel, Death, Carcass, Aldimiola, Aldimiola, the famous, the famous uh, 
guitar icon, primarily acoustic guitar, but a guitar icon. Don Felder from the Eagles, he's the guy who wrote Hotel California, Cradle of Filth, so many others throughout the pages of Scars and Guitars. If you do buy it, hit me up because I want to thank you personally. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. Until next time, it is a very good bye for now.